Everybody hear me okay? Yep. We're getting started and we are right on time because it is island time. Thank you. Thank you, whoever said that. I expected everybody to say it. Well, good morning. Welcome to Freshwater Church. It is so good to have all of you here today where we worship Jesus at the beach. Isn't it wonderful? The sound of the waves, the wind blowing through our hair. It's been it's awesome. So if you're glad to be here this morning, say amen. amen. You can do better. Say amen. amen. There we go. Now we're glad to be here. Well, on behalf of our church, I would like to thank those of you who are visiting for choosing to worship with us today. God is so good, isn't he? It's great to have you here. Well, my name is Tracy Gray, and I'm a member of Freshwater Church. Sometimes I get to preach, and I love that part, too. Uh, it's not today, so everybody sit back down. Wally's preaching today. Uh, let me give you an order of our service so you won't be wondering what's going on today. Um, after I pray this morning, then we're going to have songs by the Freshwater Choir, which, <laughs> which is uh, my wife, Terry, my girlfriend, my wife, Terry Gray, and... First Lady of Freshwater, Robin Wallace, the pastor's wife. That's right. And it just flows so well. And then we're going to have a scripture reading brought by Vicki. And then uh, the message from Pastor Wally. And then our choir is going to return with one more song. And then Mr. Michael Reidelbach will come up and give the announcements and close us in prayer. Okay? I think I covered everything. So... One more thing, let's go ahead and I want to open up in prayer over the service this morning. So pray with me, please. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much that you've given us such a gorgeous day today to be able to come together and worship you. And Father, just prepare our hearts now as we get ready to receive your word that you have placed on Brother Wally's heart to give to us today. And Father, I just want to pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit on the lives of each one of us here. Pray that, the, that you will touch our hearts this morning. Give each one of us the message that you have brought us here to listen to. And Lord, move us to action in spreading the gospel to the entire island and help us to take up the full armor of God so that we may be bold in spreading your gospel. Lord, give Wally your strength and your wisdom. Help him to be clear and concise today as he is your mouthpiece. And we just praise you for what you're going to do today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. First lady. Well, oh, my my job. <laughs> All right, would y'all stand and worship with us? We're going to turn to song number thirty-four. Lord, I lift your name on high. Okay. Can you lay it right here? Yep. Theoretically, I do. All right. <laughs> Ready? Uh -huh. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the grave to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i love to sing your praises i'm so glad so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on Turn to song number 38, Our God. Okay, here we go. All right. Yep. Water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God, our God Into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power Number 32. Holy is the Lord. This one's one of my favorites. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing, everyone sing, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. It's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. It's rising. 
rising up all around in Seattle of the Lord's renown. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Our first reading this morning is from Psalm chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered from me. He answered me from his holy hill. Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. It's so good to be here at Freshwater, and um, I have to, before we get started, um, I would tell you just how this sermon came to be. I'd, I had totally written a sermon and had it all the way done. And it was one of those things that the whole time I was doing it, I kind of felt like something was off. And then I have some men that, that we share our sermons together. We we call it a tomato board where we get ready to throw tomatoes at each other. Well, I got some tomatoes. No, it, um, and we just talked about how we needed a rewrite. And so... I needed a rewrite. Well, I get I, I was able to get away to the Oasis, which is a parsonage that we're under construction. And I get there and Gregory was doing some work and he was drilling concrete. And so that's not very conducive to preparing a sermon. But he he didn't do it long. But I tell you what, this ser this sermon came together, and it was, was one of those cool God things. So, um, And if it bombs, it's because of me. It's not because of the Lord. But I was excited to see God work in such a way. But we're going to pray, and I'm also going to pray for John, our former pastor. He is preaching today in, uh, at a church that they're considering partnering together. Um, so I think that's just, uh, I'd like to honor him by praying for him. And uh, as they uh, prayerfully consider um, pouring into another church. So. Let, let's open up with prayer. God, I thank you so much that uh, you love us and you have called us here to worship you. Lord, we thank you so much for John and Ann who have so faithfully poured into us through, for many years. And Lord, right now John is uh, getting ready to uh, preach at another church and uh, they're looking at possibly pouring into that fellowship. And Lord, I just pray that you will lead and go before them. Lord, I pray you'll cover John with your peace and also with your direction. And Lord, I just pray that you'll be with John and Ann and give them some clear direction and clarity. Lord, I thank you so much for your word, and I, Lord, I pray that you'll prepare our hearts today. Lord, help us to hear from you. Help us to just uh, hear your word and, and learn from you. And I just pray that you'll speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, and give us something to do with what you're telling us in your word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're continuing our series called Stand, uh, and because we're talking about putting on the full armor of God. And our text today, the main text, is Ephesians 6.16. 6, now, it's found on page 1082 of your Beach Chair Bible. And if you need a Bible, don't have one, please consider that Bible yours. Um, we actually have some extra boxes that have come in, so that's a great, great thing. So we're really uh, excited about those extra Bibles that we have on hand. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. 
You know, soldiers of any army, they, they train so that they can be prepared to combat their enemies at, at any time. And as believers, you know, we're given some spiritual tools to uh, battle because we're in a spiritual war as well. You know, our, our enemy is Satan. And it sounds dramatic, doesn't it, when we talk about warfare and we talk about being in a spiritual war. Uh, but from the moment that God breathed life into Adam and when he formed Eve, God's enemy, Satan, became the enemy of all mankind. He, he doesn't want... He, he hates us. And, you know... Because we're the object of God's great affection, we become the object of Satan's great hatred. Because we bear his image, we look like God. So when he looks at us, he sees God. And so he wants to wipe us out, he wants to take us out. And our, you know, our enemy hates us just because our Creator loves us. And because the Bible teaches us that there are spiritual forces against us, and we must understand that we need to stand against our enemy. Now, we've said before, our enemy is not people. It's a spiritual enemy. It, our enemy is Satan and his, his followers, and his, his demons. So we have these spiritual forces that are against us. Um, but it's not people. And today's message has two main points. First is, what are Satan's fiery darts? And secondly, how is the shield of faith our defense? The fiery or flaming darts, they're, they're aimed at us, they're aimed at believers. And the goal is to throw us off course from what God wants us to do. You know, He's called us to do something with our lives, and He loves to derail those plans. And He wants to derail our lives by distracting us from, from three areas. He wants to distract us with our needs versus our wants, which the Bible kind of calls our he calls, calls our flesh, the, the stuff that we desire that may not be of, of Him. The devil also wants to distract us in, in our outward lives so we kind of seek and crave self-attention. And then finally, our enemy wants us to take us away from our mission, which is to worship God and to live for Him. Anything that he can do to take us away from those, he'll do that. And so in, in Matthew 4, we find that Jesus is alone in the wilderness. And he's about to begin his public ministry. He had just been baptized and he is ready to start his earthly ministry. He, he, he had clarity and he is, as he is praying in the wilderness, he's getting clarity of what he's here to do. I think, you know, he, as he's praying and wrestling with God, he said, all right, Father, I want to do what you want me to do. And he sees what's ahead. He knows at the end of his ministry is the cross. And he knows what he's going to have to do. But he's got to do some things before that happens. And so he is praying and he's fasting and he's getting a alone with God. Well, in that time of aloneness, he's, as he's starting that public ministry, he was tempted by the tempter. And we're reading out of Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. I don't have the page number. If somebody has it, yeah, I can, can shout it. 897? So Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written... He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest, they stri lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All those I will give you, and you will fall if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. You know, this is our Savior. And... He faced temptation. He faced the same kind of temptations that, that we face. And, and the place where, where he was tempted was a, a real place. It was traditionally regarded as Jebel Quarantal or the Mountain of Temptation. And it overlooks the Jordan Valley. 
near the site of ancient Jericho. And in the middle of this temptation, he was also taken up to Jerusalem, to the top of the temple, and then back to a mountaintop where he could see the kingdoms of the world. And it's reminding us that really temptation can take place anywhere. We don't have to be in a certain spot. It can happen anywhere. In Matthew, the first four verses, that that's when the temptation started. and When Jesus was led up by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was hungry. Well, my goodness, I'm hungry after four hours. I can imagine 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. And the tempter came. And, and, you know, our enemy loves to pounce on us right when we're at our weakest spot. That's what he does. And he starts to challenge him. He says, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to turn to become loaves of bread. And then Jesus replies. And every reply that Jesus gives is Scripture. That's how he fought his enemy. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. So that's what he used to fight Satan. But I want you to notice here that you know, he was led into, by the Spirit to the wilderness so he could be tempted. God led him there. Now, I want to be clear. God doesn't tempt us. God didn't tempt Jesus. And he doesn't tempt us at all. Now, he will lead us into tests and he'll lead us into trials. But the goal of everything that the Father brings to us, the goal is for us to be like Jesus. He's changing us to be like him. That's his goal, is for us to glorify him and to be just like Jesus. Jesus was tempted to show the world that he was perfect. And even in his perfection, he can still relate to us. He, he can relate to us when we pray to him and say, God, you don't understand how hard this is. And Jesus says, yeah, I know how hard it is. I've been there. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be you know, angry. And he knows what it's like to be abandoned and lonely. All these things. He knows these feelings. And as he is facing these things, there's something that we can relate to our Savior. So after, as he was hungry, you know, he was fasting and Satan came and he tried to take advantage of those physical needs and wants. And that's a fiery dart that our enemy uses on us. You know, he wants us to be focused on the flesh, on the stuff of life that, that we consider really important. And, and it's something that in us it seeks gratification. And, and Jesus, you know, he didn't oppose the Father. He said, God, I'm not against you. God, Father, I'm not against you. But the flesh fights against those things that God wants for us. You know, and it's not hard for us, you know, to be you know, focused on, on what we want, is it? Is it? Is it hard to focus on what we want? No, that, that's pretty easy. You know, we can look at any toddler and see the flesh in action. And that focus, me, 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 it's all about me. You know, look at any toddler and they'll do that. You know, our enemy knows that in these times we are vulnerable to attack. And, and as we've talked about the full armor of God, we, we understand, we know that Satan wants to keep us from making any kind of impact for God's kingdom. He wants to cripple us. He wants to wipe us out so we don't do anything for his kingdom that will last forever. But if we're focused on a, our selfish needs and wants, then we're going to be drawn away from God himself and what he wants, which is to change us in a way that our desires actually change to be like his. He changes our hearts and our lives to where instead of wanting stuff that... And some of the stuff we want may not be bad, but it may not be the best of what He wants for us. And as we get to know Him, He changes our hearts and He changes our lives to be like Him. And we've got to be aware that these attacks are coming. In 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary... The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The attacks are going to come. We've got to be vigilant. I love, somebody told me this years ago, that really when you look at our enemy, he's like a caged lion. Now, if you get in the cage, he's going to tear you up. But if you stay away from that cage, he's defeated. And that's where our enemy is defeated. Satan is defeated. Now, another fiery dart that Christ had to fight. That was the temptation to have a selfish focus or, or seeking attention for himself. Matthew 4, 5-7 through 7 says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. 
Jesus replied, He said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And we live in a day where people, people want to bring attention to themselves. You know, that we want, you know, we want our videos to go viral. We want our name in the news in a good way. <laughs> and we want people to notice us. You know, that's, and, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but when that becomes our focus, when that becomes our drive. You know, and Jesus was tempted when Satan tried to get him to throw himself down off the top of the temple. You know, Jesus could have been at the top of the temple for all to see. And he could have said, look at me. But he knew that it wasn't time for that yet. It wasn't time that his day for being glorified would come, but starting his earthly ministry to serve and his calling that would eventually lead to the cross. Jesus said, you know, it's not time yet. It's not time for me to be glorified and lifted up. That time is, is now. We are now to lift him up. But the time when he was beginning his ministry, it was time for him to start that earthly ministry. The desire for attention can be confused as, as really as, as a need. We think that we need it, we think that we, and, and we definitely want it. But our enemy, he wants us to, to be attention seekers so we can try to fill that need with something that we think we really want. And Satan also, you know, he wanted Jesus to try or even tempt God the Father. You know, and that's one of the tricks that, uh, of the Garden of Eden. You know, Satan wants us to, to look for attention. He also wants us to test the Lord, to not trust the Lord. So when, when Satan was tempting Eve, you know, and we think of the examples we have. Okay, we're talking about the temptation of Christ. That's who we need to be talking about because he was the only one that perfectly took care of temptation. He, he was tempted and didn't sin. Eve, on the other hand, Adam too, not so much. So he said to the, he's, this is the Satan talking to Satan, the, the Satan talking to Eve. So he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So she knew what God was saying. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. If for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, just like Satan tempted Jesus, he tempted Eve that, that same way by trying to test God. You know, and we can be tempted to test God instead of trusting Him. Say, you know, God, I want to make sure you're saying this instead of just believing and having faith in what He is telling us to do and telling us in His Word. You know, when we test God, we're waiting for Him to move in a way that we think is best. We say, you know, God, I, I think you should move in this way, and I think I'm going to see if you do that. And it's a sneaky, fiery dart that likes to strike where our focus is. And instead of our focus being on God and His ways, you know, our focus has moved to ourselves, and then we're thrown off course. You know, Satan also aimed a, a fiery dart to move the mission that God had for Jesus. You know, he has plans for us, and he had plans for Jesus. And, and Satan wanted to throw those plans off. In you know, Matthew 4, 8 through 10 says, Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. But then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve, and him only shall you serve. You know, Jesus, he was laser focused. He was on a mission. And his mission was to do the will of the Father. And he knew that that mission would eventually lead to the cross. But that's what he was here for. And Satan wanted to derail that. He wanted to stop it. And Satan knew that if he could get Jesus to bow down and worship him, it was game over. Done. And he would have kept Jesus from his mission on earth and mankind would not have been saved. Jesus' primary mission is ours too, and that's to worship God, to obey God, because we are here on this planet to glorify Him in all that we do. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see that. Jesus said, Father, not my will, but Your will be done. That's what we're here to do. We're here to do the will of the Father. You know, from scriptures, the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it's, it's a fancy way of some, some ways to unpack what the Bible teaches. 
And the, the question that this answering is, what is the chief end of man? What's the big deal? What should we be all about? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's what we're here for. We're here to glorify Him and to enjoy Him. You know, a lot of people think that following God is, is a chore. Or, but my goodness, we get to interact and have a relationship with the Creator of the universe. He loves us. He's a lover of our souls. He, he went to great lengths to save us. And we get to have a relationship and enjoy Him forever. When we're glorifying God and how we live and we are fulfilling the very reason we are created. And, you know, so many people are empty. You know, I've been empty. I, I had a, there was a post that I responded to. It says, is there a time when you ran away from God? And I, I call it my nine months of stupidity. For nine months, I really ran away from the Lord. But when I came back, I came back because I knew that in only Jesus is true life found. And, and when we enjoy Him, you know, our enemy sees that and he wants to thwart us from living for God, just like he did with Jesus. You know, Satan wants us to worship anything or anyone as long as it isn't God. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if it's a tree. He doesn't care if it's a, an ant, if ourselves, food, whatever it is. He doesn't care as long as it's not God. When we're distracted by the things of life, that's when we place more importance on those things and then we're thrown off from our mission of why we're really here on this planet. And when we're thrown off, we fall wounded by the fiery darts. So if we have these fiery darts closing in on us, well, how can we defend ourselves? You know, we've been talking about the spiritual armor of God, putting on the full armor of God to defend ourselves. In our main text, it says, In all circumstances, not some of the time, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And that's our second point. Our second point is how the shield of faith is our defense. So we have these darts coming our way. How do we defend ourselves? You know, faith is faith in God, it shields us because it shifts our dependence from ourselves to dependence on God. We're saying, you know, it's easy for me to trust in me because I know me, but God, I want to trust in you because He is secure. And when we have faith and let go and trust Him, that's when He starts to protect us. He becomes our shield. And in placing our faith in Him, we trust Him in everything, and then we pick up that shield of faith. And this faith is an overflow from our salvation, and it's a protection against our enemy. You know, when Paul wrote Ephesians, he was in a Roman prison, and he saw these shields. He saw soldiers, and he knew what they looked like. You know, these Roman shields, they were about three and a half feet tall and about two feet wide. And... And they were made of wood and they were covered with canvas and leather. If they were just wood, they wouldn't have been very good defenses against fiery darts. But when they covered them with leather and canvas, that helped extinguish those fiery darts. These Roman shields would be you know, put together like if there was a unit together, they could actually put them together. And I actually saw some pictures as I studied. It was really cool. They would actually almost make a shelter out of these shields. So they could, as a unit, come together and they would kneel. And so they would have a, a wall of shields there and a wall of shields on the sides. And then they'd even have a wall of shields up top. And so they were completely covered. And isn't that what the church is? We're supposed to be that for each other. We're supposed to be carrying the shield and we're supposed to be helping protect each other because that shield is in place for that. And that's what we're, you know, in this this protection from, you know, this shield of faith. And it's, it's when we trust in God and we trust in Him and He starts to protect us and we're shielded. And as we live out our faith, we're shielded and those flaming darts are extinguished. You know, the, the fiery darts are going to come. But this shield of faith extinguishes them. I mean, I love that. Because, you know, if it hit just a regular wooden shield, it would burn up. But it's covered with the leather and it's covered with, you know, the canvas. And it is made to protect us. To look back at the temptation of Jesus and how was he shielded from the attack of the enemy. You know, if we need to look at anybody and how they face temptation and how they face fiery darts, we need to look to Jesus. Well, first and foremost, Jesus completely trusted the Father. When we place our complete faith and trust in God through Jesus and in what He did for us, we no longer have to fight on our own. 
You know, we have God Himself fighting for us. And Jesus knew this, and He defended His heart, He defended His mind, and He defended His life against the enemy by trusting in God. He knew that God the Father had a plan. He may not have understood it all, but He trusted God. And in, these, in three, the three responses from Jesus, we can look at each one and how faith shielded the Savior and how it can shield us too. All of these answers are from the Word. That's how He fought His enemy. And that's how we fight our enemy. We, we, we pour into this. And when, God, when, when Satan says, you know, you would be happier if, fill in the blank, and you say, no, I am fulfilled through Jesus. He makes me whole. And you start fighting with this. That's what Jesus did. So Jesus didn't place his trust in the things of this world. And, you know, food is necessary to live. So the, he responded to, to the whole thing with turn these stones into bread. He said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. He was shielded from that dark. Christ had faith that the Father that He knew that these words of God, the words of God and the Word of God is far more vital to life than anything here on earth. You know, God's words are eternal. They last forever. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God's word stands. When we have faith that, you know, that we're going to be satisfied and fulfilled by God, then those things in our flesh that, that you might pull for us, it's going to lose its hold on us because we find life in Jesus and life in His Word. So what are we trusting in? Are we trusting in the temporary things of the world? They just don't last. They're not good enough. So let us place our trust in the eternal forever things of God. And then we're going to be protected from the trap of selfish desires. So Jesus responded. Jesus said to him, again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. We can ask simply, are we testing God or are we trusting God? Are we testing to see if He's really for real? Are we testing to see if He's if truthful? Or are we trusting Him? God, I just trust You no matter what. When we get to that moment of trusting Him, that's where the temptation starts to lose its power. In His temptation, Jesus was tempted to throw Himself down from the top of the temple, testing God to save Him. You know, from a building that was made to worship God, Jesus was tempted to make it all about Him, and there wasn't time for that. You know, eventually everything will be about Jesus, but Jesus knew that that time was not at hand. And it's so easy for us, isn't it, to make life all about us? You know, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm a recovering selfish narcissist. I mean, because, you know, I used to, I remember when I was very, very little. Yeah, Robin can, Robin's... I've, I've, God has really changed me, and but I, I could be selfish. And you know, when we make much of ourselves and our wants and our needs and desires, they can take over. They can take over real easily. But when we surrender and we have we place our faith in God and His ways, then we are shielded from the flaming darts that would take our focus off of God. He protects us. And thank God He changed me. That's who He is. And if we are following Jesus and we're close to Him, then He shields us because we're near Him. We're close. We're covered. We're protected. You know, I remember talking to our kids. We raised a whole bunch of foster children and, and, and we're still raising Lily. She's ours. And it's like an umbrella of protection. You know, it's like, you know, if we're under the protection of God, we're, we stay there, we're protected. But when we wander, it's not that He wants to punish us, it's just that we're not under His covering. And that's what He does. He covers us. He protects us when we're close to Him, when we're near. So Jesus, you know, the last temptation that he, he said, this is what He said to Satan. He said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. And Him only shall you serve. If we're distracted from God and, and focused on ourselves, then we're not going to be right with our relationship with Him. You know, it's easy to worship other things in our lives. And whatever we worship, it takes our time, it takes our thoughts, and it takes our attention. And, and we're going to give everything we can to that object of worship, whatever it is. We're created, though, to worship God and Him alone. We're, we're made to worship Him. And when we surrender to Him, He completes us. And He fills our deepest need for the sacred presence 
of God Himself in our hearts and lives. See, we're, we're born with a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And only God can fill that hole. But boy, we try. We try to fill it with whatever it is. And we think that might complete us, but it won't. By our surrender, when we give up our claim to ourselves, it places, when we place our faith in God, then He shields us from the temptation to worship something or someone other than Himself. We fight that temptation. So, you know, the, the days are evil. We, you know, look at the news. We've talked about that the last several weeks as we talked about the spiritual warfare that we're in. The days are evil and Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore, the whole reason we need to take up the full armor of God, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all, to stand firm. These are the times when we need help the most and we have God Himself to help us in every circumstance. We're not alone in this. No matter what the situation, God is in control. And as we trust Him, as we give our lives to Him, He will work through every circumstance. I'm convinced of that. I've seen God work in every circumstance in my life. I've seen it work in other believers' lives. It's so amazing to hear others, other people's testimonies of how God is working. Because that's what He does. He's at work in us, and when He works all things, He works all things for the good of those who love Him. It, it doesn't, you know, as long as we obey Him perfectly. No, if we love Him, if we give our hearts to Him, then all things work together for the good of those who love Him. It's a promise in Scripture that says, and we know that for those who love God, that's the requirement, to love Him. All things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. That's how God can use everything for good. It doesn't matter what has happened, He can use it for good, even the bad stuff. And our source for help isn't our effort at all. We, we can try to take the moral high ground and we think we've won the victory by really trying hard and being good people, but the source of our justification of being made right is and victory is in God and what He did. And when we have faith to believe that, we hold on to that shield of faith and we are shielded and protected. So as we close out today's message, let's remember, if you remember one thing at all, is to trust God in everything. You know, Satan wanted to throw Jesus in, off of really the plan and he wanted to, to remove his trust in, in his God and his Father. And, you know, look for examples. Look for examples of faith to follow. Look, look out for the flaming darts to avoid. You know, we have, as believers, we have the full armor of God at our disposal to fight the enemy. And our victory is found in surrender because victory is already won. We've been talking about the paradox of this, isn't it? Isn't it crazy that we find victory through surrender? That doesn't make sense in the, in the world. But in the spiritual realm, in what God is doing, it makes sense. And that victory is found in that surrender. You know, since Jesus defeated death, because He did that, we are free from Satan's power and He has no hold on us. And I pray that we all as believers take up the shield of faith so we can be shielded. As we close out, I'm reminded of a parable that Jesus told. It's Matthew 7, 24-27. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine, so everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, I don't share that to scare anybody. It's just a, really a fact of life. When, we have, when we're founded on the rock, who is Jesus, when we build our life on Him, our life stands strong. But when we're founded on ourself or on anything else that's not Him, it's shifting sands and it's just like building a house right there at the beach. It just won't stand. I pray for us believers that as we listen to what God is saying to us today, I pray that we'll not only listen, but we'll move our lives to a place of obedience. We will move our lives to hear His Word and to obey it. Our surrender and obedience secures victory in our lives that Jesus has already won through His life, through His death, and through His resurrection. 
And if you're here and you're not a believer, today can be a day where you accept Christ and you believe Him. And, and it's a bunch of church words, but the basic thing is this. You come to the place where you understand that, that we've sinned and that sin separates us from God. But God made a way for us to know Him and, that, and Jesus bridged the gap. And He made a way for us to be forgiven. When He died on the cross, His blood sh was shed and it covered our sin. And I don't know why God set that up, but the re God said for sin to be forgiven, blood had to be shed. Well, for thousands of years, animals were sacrificed, but that blood wasn't good enough. But Jesus, His blood was, because He was tempted. He was perfect. And His perfect blood covers those sins and, and we're forgiven. I, I remember in philosophy class, I'm going to tell a quick, very short story. Um, the professor says, I don't understand how a loving God could infinitely punish someone for just a finite amount of sin. Well, I was a religion major and I was a believer in Jesus and I kind of raised my hand and he said, Wallace, what you got there? I said, well, you know those 3D glasses? When well, he kind of crooked his head a little bit. I said, well, you get a white piece of paper and you write sin in red ink on that piece of paper and magic marker. And I said, now you pass that blue lens of that 3D glass because you the blue lens and the red lens. And I said, you can see that sin. It is right there. I said, when God sees our sin without Jesus, we, He can't have fellowship with us because He can't have fellowship with sin. I said, but you pass that red lens over and you don't see that sin anymore. And that's the same thing with our sin in Jesus' blood. When He sees His, His Son's blood over our sin, He doesn't see our sin anymore because it's covered, it's forgiven. He didn't call on me anymore after that. But, but the thing is, you know, we do have salvation through Jesus. And He does cover us. And He has given us the tools to be able to stand against the fiery darts of our enemy. So let's, let's pray. If you need to know Jesus, please find one of us. We'd love to pray with you and talk with you. God, I thank you so much for this big, great news that you love us and that you gave away, you made a way for us to come to know you. Lord, you're not, you're not leaving us alone. You're not leaving us struggling. Lord, you, you made a way. So Lord, I pray that we will trust you. I pray that we will surrender to you. And in this surrender, we find victory because you won the victory. Lord, you defeated sin. You defeated death. And we get to worship you and we get to you know, glorify you and enjoy you forever. So Lord, I pray that we will pick up the shield of faith. I pray that you will give us boldness as we continue on with this week. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. And we thank you that you can make us whole. And you have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, would y'all stand and sing one final song with us? We're going to sing one of the pages in the front of your books, um, Victory in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Page, just got it? Mm. 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 I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory What do you think of our choir? Mormon Tabernacle Choir, eat your heart out. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. We have uh, a four-word mission statement. 
It's very simple. Four words define everything that we do at Freshwater, including the service that you just participated in. Four simple words. Love God, love people. Say it with me. Love God, love people. It's very simple, but it's poignant. And if you think about it, it's the directive that Jesus gave us when he descended, ascended out of the earth. Go forth and teach all nations. Share with them the good news of the gospel. And that's what we do. We're especially excited about the people that are visiting us today. But raise your hand if you're a visitor today. And without taking an exact count, that's about fit. <laughs> Amen. That's about 50% of the congregation this morning. And we know that you had some other choices this morning. Maybe a couple choices, like the beach, like the sand, like the sea. But you didn't take those choices. Instead, you chose to worship with us in fellowship with this group. And I want you to know that your presence made the fellowship far more stronger than it would have been without you. And we thank you for being a part of this today. Truly, it is a part of loving that. Now, we'd like to keep the relationship that you've started by showing up today going. If you're of the same mind, Vanna is in the back there by the, holding up a card. And that is an information card. And if you'd be kind enough to fill that out, we'll be kind enough to and put it in the deposit box. We'll make sure that we keep your information uh, confidential. But what it does is allows us to communicate throughout the year to you and allows you to communicate to us so that even though you may not be here every week, you feel like you were. So we hope you will do that. If worship, if giving donations is part of your worship service, we also have a same card for, for information, and you can put that in a deposit box as well. We, Vanna is holding up the official envelope to put in there. We also have Bible study on Wednesday. We have two of them. One at the Cruise Bay end of the island, which is at Wally's house. At 6 o'clock, where are you, Wally? Right. 6 o'clock? 6.30. <laughs> See, there's one in Coral Bay, and they just want to be different. 6.30, Wednesday, Wally's house. If you want to go to that one, see him. If you want to come to the beautiful end of the island, which is Coral Bay, amen. Let's hear it for Coral Bay. Then that one is at 6 o'clock, and it's at Linda and I's house. And see one of us after church, and we'll tell you how to get there. We'd love to have you. The last thing I want to refer to today is the Project Oasis. You heard... Wally mentioned it at the beginning. We were fortunate enough about six months ago to purchase a building. We call it Oasis, as he said, because it's a spiritual retreat. It's a, pre a place where refreshment spiritually can be sought by, our, by anybody that wants to visit us. We're excited about it. We've gotten to the point where we bought it, we purchased it, and we're 50% of the way into renovating it. If you want to be a part of that in any way, shape, or form, prayer, donations, labor, see one of us, see myself or Wally, and we'll find a way to get you into it. The Project Oasis is coming along very nicely. What are we going to do with it? Well, it's a multi-purpose building. One is it's going to be a parsonage for, our, uh, our, for Wally and, and Robin to live in. But it's also going to be a place where we can do discipleship, train up individuals to go out into the community and reach the people of the island. Obviously, it'll be a place that we can do Bible study in Cruz Bay. It is, it'll be a remote place for our, our administrative kinds of duties as well. So if you're interested in it and you're excited about it, as we are, I said we're 50 percent into it and we're getting there. Before I close out, I want to invite you all to the other pavilion after the service is over. We have a potluck lunch, and the ladies have fixed something. Every week it changes, so I don't know what it is. But I do know this about it. It's good. And that's the most important thing about it. So before we close out, I'm asking Krista if she'll come up and lead us in the closing prayer. Thank you. It's a little windy here. Yeah. Uh, in closing, I just wanted to say we give thanks for this time of reflection, prayer, and worship here at Freshwater and for all the faithful around the world today who are praying for the needs of faith, the need of faith and peace. During this time of Lent, as we seek to know Jesus and to improve our relationship with him, 
I thought I would share a prayer that I grew up with, and that one that I'm sure many of you also know. It was for myself and still today my daily reminder of what I believe the sum of all things that our belief teaches us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Krista. Thank you all for being here again. Food's over in that pavilion. Have a great day.